uh, logging in from. This is what we'd like to do today is, is pretend we're at our annual meeting face to face and uh, it's now um, the Seedball Project's opportunity to talk about their progress during last year and issues they've encountered, uh, findings that they'd like to share, and then think about um, the next steps moving forward, much in the same way we've done in the past. Now that we're doing it um, virtually, um, we have a few things that we want to, uh, we have a couple of uh, opportunities. One is that we have a little bit more time with each presentation, so we can um, take advantage of those that time in order to uh, um, ask questions and discuss a little bit more in greater detail. I have to say that in the past, I've been a bit frustrated having to limit discussion when it gets going very well. So Christine um, Desky, I'd like to just introduce her as our new program coordinator. This is her first time for you to put a, a face with a name. There she is. She's going to be in charge of muting uh, everybody's uh, microphones and she can do so right now. Now, a couple of things uh, just to orient you on Zoom. If you need to make just a quick uh, comment um, or ask a question, um, if you mouse down to the bottom of your screen, there's a, um, at the bottom, you'll see a participants um, sort of tab there. If you click on that, it'll open up a new window. Tim, I think you're muted. Tim, we don't hear you anymore. You don't Sorry. hear you anymore. <laughs> Sorry, it's my fault. I'm muted, everybody. everybody. Sorry. Can you hear me now, Luger? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I muted everybody. I'm sorry, Tim. Okay, you muted everybody a little bit too quickly. So she's, <laughs> as you can see, Christine is is ready to go. So um, with that, I have no other sort of points of, uh, uh, to bring before we move ahead. Again, we wanna welcome everybody here. This is very interesting times uh, for all of us and uh, what we thought yesterday seems to change today. So we are really adapting and putting into force what um, um, at a very hyper uh, hyperactive speed what Peter Matlin advocated at the very beginning on adaptive management, we're all learning as we move forward and um, the best thing we can do is keep in communication with each other. So uh, with this, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to uh, Ludger. Um, Christine, go ahead and um, mute everyone else and uh, accept Ludger and then I think Charles will take over. Okay, L Ludger and Charles will still be on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Dear Tim, thanks a lot for, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for everybody being here yeah. on the web. Uh, I'll take over actually as a presentation of the project since, since uh, Charles uh, does not feel uh, very well. He has a kind of allergy and that's why actually I'm taking over. The plan was different, but as Tim said, we are adapting oh. from moment to moment to what is happening. Can you actually see my screen already or not? Yes. yes, we see it. You see it. Okay, then I start the presentation. And uh, actually, please feel free to interrupt me at any moment. Uh, I'm open for discussions uh, also in between. Uh, I have about uh, 20 slides that I would like to present. And perhaps uh, it's better to have, have an open discussion rather than going through, through the whole presentation and then trying to discuss at the end. But whatever you how you would like to do it I, I can adapt so uh, actually we are speaking about the seedball project which is now in uh, the second uh, phase and uh, what is different from the first phase if you remember in the first phase actually we tried to develop the technology as such, and we were able to do so and also to introduce it into field testing. And uh, what are now the differences 
in comparison to phase one. Actually, we skipped the activities in Senegal because um, it appeared that in Senegal, uh, we did approach the wrong regions and we had also from time to time difficulties with the counterparts over there. So we said we want to continue where we have been successful, that is in uh, Niger, thanks to the team over there, to uh, Inran and Fuma Gaskia in person of Anatu and uh, Aminu, who are here also in uh, this uh, session. And we wanted then but, uh, to uh, actually spatially enlarge our in intervention zone and go to Southwest Niger, where also a lot of pearl millet is grown. So we included the farmer org organization Mori Ben uh, over there. Actually, in the last days, we had uh, communication problems and in that respect, that is why nobody is here on the line, I think. Uh, but we will try to develop new communication uh, pathways. It appeared that in order to distribute the technology, uh, we need also to collaborate with other projects, uh, in particular in order to open a farming systems perspective, which is now necessary. I think it's not furthermore necessary to test the te technology as such, but how it fits into the farmer system. So that's why we wanted to combine different innovations or let's say different management uh, measures that is additional fertilization because we know that the seed ball technology is mainly aiming at the first weeks of development. So more or less the first three weeks after that the effect is going to vanish. And so we wanted to test it together with what we call post-emergence fertilization. So once the crop is established, then we go in with further, um, with further fertilization because then that is no economic risk anymore. There are other technologies like partial weeding, which we can uh, add to the concept and also OGA that is actually fermented human urine. That is an auto technology that was developed by Fuma Gaskia in person by Ali Aminu. So uh, another question was, if we are already in the farming systems approach, whether we can uh, use this technology also for sorghum. And we have to discuss uh, during this meeting whether that is a real option. I see some constraints, but we come to this point uh, later. Uh, another the question was whether we could uh, mechanize actually the production of seed balls. Why? Simply because that is a kind of laborious experience and that's mainly done by man. So, so we thought whether we could develop a kind of uh, mechanization, first of all, also to attract men in joining into the technology and also to open a business option. So here, here Professor Müller from agriculture and engineering in the University of Hohenheim is responsible. And then we wanted to evaluate the, the method that was brought on the table already by Tim in the last phase, that we do not really have a sound economic evaluation and also social aspects should be considered. We come back to these points later. So uh, now you do not need to see uh, in detail what is here on, uh, on the screen on the right hand side. It's more or less a work plan for the first year. You see that we have uh, overall a mixed balance in green is what was accomplished and uh, orange is uh, more or less what we uh, have done, but not in the numbers that we have uh, planned. And in red is what we could not really accomplish. We, we will come to the single points one by one in the later presentation. So uh, what was uh, a little bit stopping us was last year, uh, the relative late uh, release of the funds that led finally to the fact that we need to, needed to cross fund uh, our activities in the field from other projects, uh, namely Cartigao and the women's project that are funded by the McKnight Foundation. Overall, that leaded to a reduced number of on-farm activities. Um, I think that is uh, uh, not that a great problem. We had to reduce from about 1,000 on-farm trials to about 750, so it's still three quarter of what we expected to do. So I think in this respect, we are fine. 
a, a real problem is uh, mechanization. We developed a prototype, you will see that later on, uh, but uh, I'm not really convinced with the results. And then still uh, we have the evaluation processes and the economic and social dimension. And also we had problems in reaching the farmers in the Southwestern Asia together with the Muriben farmer organization. There was field testing, but we couldn't use the data. There have been many questions by farmers that we could not actually answer due, due to communication problems. And we have to solve this problem this year. So overall a mixed balance, but we are on a good way. Yeah, so uh, I'm optimistic uh, for this year, though we have to face, uh, to face uh, this corona story. So now uh, for the yield effects, CPO type, probably you remember that in the last years, so from 2016 to 18, we had an, uh, on average, a yield increase by the seed ball technology by about 30%. Now, if you look on the actual data for 2019, you see that this has not been reached and uh, that the re yield increase is lower between 10 and 20%, more or less, depending on the seed ball type. So what are the possible explanations? Actually, I have two to offer. So first one is that, what, that it was a quite uh, normal season. Uh, the rainfall amount was a little bit less than the normal average, but it was well distributed. So we had a relative good season and in the good season, it seems that uh, the yield effect of seed balls is lower. Yes, seed balls are more performing in let's say kind of difficult uh, seasons. But I think the more important argument here is the post-emergence fertilization because of the data that you see here, uh, about 50% of the farmers applied the post-emergence fertilization. That means that the control yields uh, have, been, uh, <coughs> have been higher. Uh, and we have, to, um, we have to acknowledge that um, Pearl millet has a high phenotypic plasticity and it seems that it can compensate, let's say, for a bad development in the early stages if there are sufficient nutrients applied at a later stage. I think we can see that in more detail in the next slide. So that might be a little bit difficult, so I try to explain what we see here actually um, we tried to separate here the data sets for, uh, first of all, uh, the wood ash amended seed balls and uh, NPK amended seed balls, so wood ash on top and NPK amended seed balls below. And on the left hand side, you see actually where we did not apply post emergence fertilization, on, on the right hand side we have applied the uh, post-emergent uh, fertilization. And what you see here is actually that uh, where we have the post-emergence fertilization, that's the median of, um, of the yield level is higher than where we did not apply it. Yeah, so we see here on the right-hand side that where we did post-emergence fertilization, that there we have lower seed ball effects and on the left hand side where we did not apply it and where we did not apply it we are actually in the uh, in the normal range that we experienced over the last years of on-farm activities. Now the question was whether we'll have an additive effect of seed ball and post-emergence fertilization and at least for the wood ash seed balls, that seems to be the case. So if we take the base level control, that is a red one on the left hand side, and look on what's, a, uh, what's now the average uh, yield is uh, with seed balls and with post emergence fertilization. So both effects together, then we reach up to 43% of yield increase. So, uh, it seems that this uh, combined that, that there is a combined uh, effect. 
So now we did a study actually on the influence of uh, soil properties on yield. And again, that is a quite complicated slide. So I try to explain that step by step. So on the left hand side, actually, we compared actually the, the correlation between uh, different uh, soil analytical uh, or soil properties uh, with yield. And if we look at that, this GMS, it actually means uh, coarse and medium sand and FS means fine sand. And then comes total carbon, total nitrogen and different nutrient fractions. And uh, what we see here is actually that um, the coarse um, grain size fraction have a negative effect on yield and the opposite is true for the fine sand. So what actually does that tell us? Uh, you must see actually these grain size information as, an, as a proxy for the water holding capacity. We know we are here in a semi-arid climate and we know that uh, water is a limiting uh, factor for plant productivity. And actually the coarse and the medium sand fraction, they cannot uh, support actually water storage in the soil. So these coarse pores are not able to store water against gravity. Whereas the fine sand can, can influence uh, strongly the water holding capacity. So that means if we would have a soil with only fine sand, we would have 20% uh, of the volume water storage capacity. So what it, this tells us is actually more a physical uh, information. The higher the fine sand content, the higher the water storage capacity. And it seems that is a, an important aspect here. So the second one with a high uh, correlation coefficient is uh, total carbon that stands actually for the soil organic matter. We have to see here soil organic matter as a complex fertilizer if you, if you want so, and upon decomposition it releases different nutrients. So these are the two major aspects I think for the fertility type status. So we have a kind of physical fertility indicator that's the water holding capacity and we have the nutrient indicator in this case, actually, mainly uh, the, soil the soil organic matter. What was astonishing to us, actually, is that uh, the available phosphorus didn't play any role in our analytics. I, for, the for the moment being, I do not really have an explanation for that, because normally in the literature you find that uh, phosphorus is the main limiting nutrient in these kind of agroecosystems. Uh, it may be that it does not show an effect here simply due to the fact that all of the samples that we analyze have been in the absolute deficiency range. Uh, so I don't know whether that's a real explanation, but that's what I would go for. Then we see that there, um, if we leave the already mentioned aspects aside, that nearly all the other nutrients uh, play, uh, play a role. Uh, and that is actually an, a known aspect in these kind of very sandy soils that we normally find as pearl millet cropping sites. Uh, if we fertilize one nutrient, actually the next one will fall into the deficiency range and limit, limit the production. And so we see here that also, for example, calcium, magnesium uh, play a role. And we have also aspects of toxicity levels that uh, we might find here. So one, the first indicator was for when we try to correlate actually soil variables with the control yield, that's important now, the control yield. Then we have seen that the ratio of calcium plus magnesium, which are the so-called basic cations and aluminum, which is an indicator for acidity, uh, also, also played a role. So now if we, we try to establish a multilinear uh, model and what we see finally in that models, uh, model, uh, we, have, uh, we have five or six different, different um, variables that come into play. One is a sowing date. Uh, that is, I think, clear. The earlier we sow, the longer, the longer is the vegetation period. The longer the vegetation period, uh, the better the potential for biomass production. 
Then we have the fine sand, that is our indicator for the water holding capacity. And then the, uh, the variable with the highest weight is actually the organic matter content, so nutrients. Then we have a, a positive impact of available iron. That is the first time uh, that I hear of that, that iron could play a positive role. I, for the moment being, I do not have an explanation for that, to be honest. Uh, that is a new aspect for me, and I have to think about how to explain that. Then we have actually a negative impact by aluminum. That is known the aluminum text toxicity in, <coughs> sorry, in the arenosols of the Sahel are a long debated topic. There are several research papers uh, on that aspects, aspect. What is new actually is this negative impact of manganese so that there might be also slight uh, manganese toxicity problems. That's also the first time that I hear that. Apart from these measurable uh, uh, variables, um, there is also influence of categorical uh, variables. That is, for example, uh, the village in which we did the experimentation and the soil type. So we try to combine that in a generalized uh, linear model. And with what we see here is that what rests as, as effect is uh, the village with a very strong effect, as you can see by uh, the correlation coefficient. The so soil type is uh, less expressed, and then we have um, more or less available cations in the soil, so that's calcium, magnesium, and potassium together, and we have the negative effect of uh, aluminum. Now, so that would be now more or less a general linear model to explain the to explain the, uh, the yield. Okay, so we see that's uh, quite complex, but that is how it is if you work with large end trials, saying we do not go to safe conditions on station, but we go really into the farm environment, and there we will see that depending where you are in the train, totally different effects occur. So, now let's deal shortly with the soil type effect. So what we used is actually not scientific soil names, but uh, the local uh, soil type concepts. And here we see four different ones. Uh, at the moment being, I do not want to go into detail, uh, but we see that depending on which soil type actually pearl millet was cropped, there is uh, a, def di a different yield level. Yeah? So if you look at Geza, which are soils which show a little bit of clay alleviation, which have a little bit heavier texture, you see that they produce the lowest yields. Whereas a Damba, where we find uh, relatively elevated nutrient contents, uh, we have definitely uh, nearly the double, double yield. So, Soil type, also the local concepts of soil types actually apply to this uh, uh, explanation of different uh, pearl millet yields. And the interesting thing here is also that the effect of the seed balls on these different soil types differed. That's why I want to present the next slide. So here on the Next slide, actually, we see the relative panicle yield uh, increase, and the green dots are actually seed balls that were amended with uh, wood ash, and the blue dots are the ones which have been amended by normal fertilizer, that is NPK. NPK. And we see now that depending on, uh, on which soil types we did apply these technologies, there is a different aspect. Uh, we must say here that actually Gigaba and Giza cover most of the surfaces in uh, this intervention region, whereas uh, Jampali and Damba uh, cover much less. That is also why the number of uh, observations are lower for Jampali and Damba than for Giza and uh, Gigaba. So for the major soils, we see that the effect is, uh, of seed balls is more or less in the expected range. That is 20 to 30% of uh, yield increase. 
and the effects of both are close to each other. What is interesting is this uh, large disparity that we find with uh, Jambali. So what is on Jambali, that's also very sandy soil. It is reddish in color and it's supposed to suffer from aluminum toxicity. So that's a major explanation. So if we want uh, actually to fight this, um, uh, this aluminum toxicity, we have to increase the pH and to bring in more basic cations like calcium, magnesium, potassium. And that's actually what wood ash does. It increases the pH, so the wood ash itself has a pH of 11, yeah? and it has a lot of water-soluble cations which are available. So it seems here that on these soils, in particular, in particular the wood ash and its heat balls uh, work quite well. If you look at the yield impact of NPK, it seems that NP and K does not seem the problem because there's no, no, yield, inc uh, no yield increase. So first of all, here we have to fight uh, actually the aluminum toxicity. And if that is done, then we can come in with further fertilizers. On Damba, it's, a, it's the inverse effect. So on the left hand side, these are actually the soils that we find dominantly in depressions. And these soils in the depression, they, they gain nutrients actually by lateral flow from the environment. And that's why they have a higher content of uh, um, exchangeable cations. Since we have a lot of cations already here available, calcium, magnesium, potassium, actually the uh, impact of the wood ash seed balls is much lower, only about 10%, whereas now the N and P, which are normally limiting the productivity, uh, yield a much higher effect. Yeah? So by understanding the differences in soil, we can explain also the different yield effects. So most in, uh, interesting topic and uh, so far for me personally, hard to explain simply because I do not know the villages and I do not know the soil property differences in these different villages which have contributed to the testing in the last, last years. Here we see uh, the large impact. You see the Spearman correlation coefficient, I think with 0.5. And uh, we see that depending on in which village you are, sometimes actually the wood ash is uh, actually the preferred uh, seed ball variety, whereas in other environments like in Alicolta, the NPK uh, amended seed balls work much better, or in Vazoo, uh, for example. So there are really different uh, responses uh, depending on in which village you work. Probably later on, uh, the local heroes in person of uh, Hanatu and, and Aminu can comment on that. Perhaps they have an idea how to explain uh, this village effect on per millet yields. Okay, so we promised to test on demand of the farmers, fungicide, in uh, the name here is calcio, that is a systemic fungicide as an additive to seed balls. So that was not our idea, it was the idea of the farmers. And uh, what was the result? It was uh, when we applied actually the rate uh, recommended by the manufacturer and that had, had a detrimental effect on germination rates. That's what you see here uh, somewhere in the middle, control normal rate, you see there's a real poor performance. Whereas if we decrease, as the farmers do actually in the field, uh, as we decrease the rate to half of the recommended rate, then it works, uh, it works perfectly. So germination is not hampered. What is an, it was an interesting to see is that even if we apply the normal rate, but we formulate it with, with the seed balls, in particular the wood ash and its seed balls, then germination was fine. That must be a, some kind of pH effect. I do not, otherwise I do not re, I have a real explanation. But what it shows is that we can actually uh, use um, this systemic fungicide uh, to treat the seeds and then 
use the seed, uh, the, the treated seeds in the seed balls. Um, because in some regions, actually, fungi attack is a major uh, factor for yield formation. And if we could fight that, that would be an option. I know there are security aspects involved in that. But to me, to be honest, many farmers already do that without any uh, training on how to use these kind of uh, fungicides. So uh, I think for the future, that this is a possibility, in particular the Mori Ben farmers from the Falwell regions, they urgently asked for this option. Okay, so then there's, there's uh, one aspect that, that was not foreseen actually in our proposal. But uh, there was actually uh, Professor Neumann from the plant nutrition group of our university who approached us and asked, couldn't we test seed balls together with what we call biofortifiers? Now, these biofortifiers are actually microorganisms that are found naturally in soils. That is vesicular arbuscular mycorrhiza, so that's a kind of fungi that attacks the roots, but actually in a kind of symbiosis um, enables the plant to make uh, use of the fine root system to take up more phosphorus in particular. And then there, is, there are other bacteria strains that normally are found together with some of our um, some of our trees and uh, these uh, actually live also in symbiosis with the plant and they deliver nitrogen into the rhizosphere. So these are the two different things that we tested. Actually, we had to, to harvest these, um, these greenhouse trials last week due to the corona story. So we did it one week in advance because we had to close down actually our laboratory activities. Never, nevertheless, we see here uh, the, some aspects. One is the development of the root system. So if we start on the left hand side, we have the control with the weakest root system. Then we have the effect of NPK fertilizer. So we see that uh, main roots as well, as well as a fine root system actually is developing if we apply fertilizer. Interesting thing was that if we apply seed balls without anything, also this has an effect and a positive effect on the development of the root system. How that really works, to be honest, I do not have a real explanation. Then further to the right, we have seed balls uh, amended with NPK. And then the three on the right hand side are actually application of uh, mycorrhiza, so SBA, then application of uh, um, the other biofortifier as bacteria. And then on the uh, extreme right hand side, uh, these, these both were combined. So we see that the combined effect actually is not really positive since. Uh, at least not for the root system, probably uh, this infection story uh, needs too much uh, energy uh, to react on that. But we see that there are different effects of different management technologies on the development of the root system of pearl millet. I would summarize that in the following, the NPK effect is mainly that we have the main root extension, so the stronger roots are developed and tend to go to greater depths. Whereas if we use the biofortifiers, these actually induce a very strong development of the fine root system, which is mainly responsible for nutrient uptake in the upper decimeter of the soil. We, mu uh, we must be clear at that, uh, at that point here that the biofortifiers are nothing that farmers could actually use at present simply because they are too expensive. But once, once we would come to a kind of a business option, there might be a possibility to include these mm -hmm. biofortifiers even into the seed pods. To make it clear in these experiments, actually the biofortifiers were applied to the soil, not to the seed pods themselves. Yeah? So we had the seed pods with the NPK and the, the wood ash, 
and the biofortifiers would was were applied to the surrounding soil. The above ground biomass, the same aspects on the left hand side, the control, and the right hand side, the effect of the combined application of mycorrhiza and bacillus. And you see uh, that there's really a great effect on, on biomass. To be honest, I was a little bit astonished. I didn't expect to have such, a, uh, such an effect in the greenhouse. Okay, whether that is something for the future, I think, think is still a topic of, uh, of research. And uh, we must see uh, whether we have time and resources to invest in that. So that have been the positive stories. Now we have also to attack the more ambivalent stories. And one is that we try to develop a prototype for the mechanization of the seed ball technology. So on the left hand side, you see here actually the machinery that was de uh, developed by our agricultural engineering department. It's a, actually a rotating drum. The idea was to use only materials that would be available also in, uh, in Niger. So that's simply an oil drum on some wheels and then there's an electric motor and that's more or less it apart from what we see on the right hand side that is a kind of sieve inlets that you have to put into the rotating drum in order to separate the different seed ball sizes that are produced. I must be honest, even with our best approaches, so far we could only produce in a single set about 60% of usable seed balls. That would mean we have a lot of material that cannot be further used and um, I do not see that if we can reach only 60%, this 60% level that this is an option that is uh, valid for use under our on-farm conditions in, uh, in uh, Niger. So we have thought about alternatives and here the major thought was that producing this seed ball dough is actually the most laborious part in the whole process. So we thought about using a simple concrete mixer in order to produce the DAO and then all the rest can still be uh, done by hand. However, it appeared that such a kind of simple concrete mixer, which costs in Germany about $200 only, uh, is not available in Niger and not even in Northern Nigeria. So we are still thinking about whether it makes sense to buy it here, transport it to Niger and try to use it over there. Uh, but uh, we have not yet come to a conclusion. Perhaps you can help us with the decision. So that's the mechanization story. So yes, we did produce a prototype, but no, we do not have an option that I would like to transport to Niger, install there and to use for seed pole production. That is also why so far we do, did not do any kind of greenhouse trials on uh, the mechanically produced seed balls. We could do that, but I, I doubt that at the moment being that really makes sense. Yeah? So that was one of the red dots in our working plan. Sorghum seed balls, another story. Sorghum also uh, has relatively fine grained seeds, but nevertheless, they are much greater than the ones of pearl millet. And the question was whether we should develop this option. There are, I think once in South Africa, there was a presentation of Charles, a posted presentation by Charles that in principle, it works out. He further worked on this topic and uh, mechanically or physically and chemically optimize it. So the outcome is finally that the sorghum seed balls need to be in diameter greater than the ones for pearl millet, simply due to the fact that the grains uh, of sorghum are greater. So the diameter then would be three centimeters. Uh, one uh, positive mention here is 
that we can increase the fertilizer dose. So in the, normally with, uh, with per minute, we apply one gram of fertilizer to the basic recipe. With sorghum, we could apply 1.5 without having osmotic effect, effects and negative impact on the germination rates. So you see here, uh, that was a trial. I mean, we needed also to harvest last week due to the corona story. Also a little bit in advance of what we wanted to do. Uh, but you see that uh, here we had actually two different uh, soil materials that we apply, one with very low fertility, that is uh, the ones which appear very bright here in the pots, and one with a high organic matter content and high nutrient stock. And you see that we have uh, for the biomass development in the first three weeks, we have uh, differences uh, which are two to four fold more or less uh, in comparison to the control. Yeah, so yes. We can apply seed balls also, also to sorghum. Uh, and uh, our counterparts in Niger said they would like to test it. My personal opinion is there are two constraints. First of all, I think it's only applicable if sorghum is planted on, uh, on nutrient poor sandy soils. There it would be probably an option, but we have to keep in mind here that we have since Actually, the volume is increasing by a factor of three uh, with the diameter. We need much more input material. And I'm not that sure whether that is worth to do it if we need so much soil material in order to produce the sorghum seed balls. So there are still some doubts. Uh, Amino indicated that uh, there might be an option to test in about 100 on-farm trials this year, also sorghum seed balls. Um, let's wait and see what the outcome will be. So uh, we have updated the seed ball fact sheet into a new version uh, that appeared necessary due to the fact that uh, there appeared a lot of questions. And one problem of seed ball application very often was that farmers did uh, place the seed balls too deep, so five to seven centimeters, which is much too deep, and then the effect uh, actually is negative. So what we added is actually um, a mention on uh, where this technology is suitable and notes on uh, what has to be respected with respect to the application. Uh, I think uh, that is very important. That is what the experience in Falwell, so with the uh, Mori Ben Pharma uh, Unity uh, Union actually showed. Uh, actually, most of the trials last year failed in that area simply because the seed balls were placed much too deep into the soil. So I have also updated the internet page. So I added uh, the second phase and I'm still working on adding all the, the, the materials that we have already produced, audio, video, poster, and scientific publications. A problem is that meanwhile, our university uh, changed the rules with respect to project uh, internet pages to be hosted, and um, they asked to actually elaborate that in a very special software, and that takes me too much time to do so. So I did it in, a, in another software, and I'm still in negotiations with our administration, whether they allow me to host this web page at our university service or not. At the moment being, there's no way of contact our, uh, our computer services, simply due to the fact that everybody has uh, to prepare for for online lectures and actually the personnel in our computer unit is overcharged at the moment. So for this little problem, uh, there's actually nobody to contact. So for, for this, but I'm working on that aspect. So uh, with respect to the publications, uh, we are fully in schedule. What we did as the last one is uh, elaborating the results of the 2016 to 18 on-farm research uh, that we did. Here are some additional uh, uh, results that I didn't uh, show so far. One is that in general, we have seen that we 
uh, have got higher pearl mill yields in man's field. That's not really astonishing. That's something what was expected, but uh, I think uh, never published. And uh, another one is that we have better results normally with wet sowing. Wet sowing here means uh, sowing with the beginning of the rainy season. That is true in normal years, but in exceptional years where we have actually a uh, retarded uh, season, um, seed balls can also have a very positive effect if applied with dry sowing. If you remember, those who have been present also in the first phase, actually one of the ideas why seed balls were developed were simply to, uh, uh, to use them with dry sowing ahead of the season, in particular in women's fields. Okay, so this one is submitted. It is not yet published, but we are, with respect to publications, we are in line with our um, plan. Training. So last year, I said already, uh, we did not reach uh, our goal of about 1,000 on-farm tests. We could uh, conduct on, uh, on that's especially uh, due to uh, the input of uh, Inran and and uh, and Puma Gaskia in person of Ali Aminu and Hannah too, who managed instead. Uh, though we had this late funding, who managed uh, by using funds of other projects uh, even to reach still 750 farmers. From those field experiments, we could use about 630 data sets. That uh, of which you have seen the results uh, earlier in this presentation. The anima animator training uh, was successful. Uh, animators of Fumagaskia as well as Mori Ben were trained during the last season. We have to think about how to manage that during this season if the coronavirus is spreading also in Niger. And we have recently done a training of Hannah too. She was here in Hohenheim for one week training together with a group of uh, Professor Knirim uh, on participatory research. And that enabled also to do the planning for our social uh, evaluation of the seed ball technology. So whether this innovation works and under which conditions. So, Future planning is a question. Um, I expect that for this season, again, we will not reach the 1,000 farmers. Uh, that will be a lower number, depending on how the situation is going to develop. We will have a stronger collaboration, <coughs> as we did already in the last year, with the Women's Field Project and the Kartigao Project that are financed by uh, the McKnight Foundation, and we are going to share the data with them here. Actually, uh, we want to have a stronger farming system perspective approach in order to understand better under which conditions the SQL technology might match with the farmer system. Sorghum on farm testing, I said already, uh, we didn't have that in our planning, but since the greenhouse trials were positive and uh, Fumagaskia responded positively too, uh, we are looking for about 100 on farm field tests with the sorghum seed balls. We still think about how we can solve this uh, mechanization issue if you have an idea please tell me, uh, we would be glad to get external input on uh, this story, economical and social uh, evaluation of the technology is still ahead of us for the social, social science evaluation. We have did the planning, but that will be also impacted by the Corona story. So the, the temporal plan is there, but I doubt that we can do it. So I pro we probably have to postpone it to uh, post-season time slot rather than beginning already in season. And we had in mind also this year to have a scientific pre-season scientific training of the students that collaborate with the project. But due to the Corona story, I think we have to postpone that to next year. I do not see a real option to do that uh, this year. So 
Last slide, contingencies and COVID-19 adaptation. So we have the case that uh, in Europe and in Germany, the frontiers are at least partially closed. Uh, the same is true for uh, Niger and Nigeria. So there might be a problem appearing exchanging personnel uh, across frontiers. Universities are partly closed. Um, and we have a retardation of, of the programs. For example, in the University of Hohenheim, we do not have uh, free access to the greenhouse facilities anymore. We have to look from which moment onwards we might be able to restart our activities uh, there. Um, what is urgently uh, asked for is to limit face-to-face -face meetings. So that will impact our, our training story, even in the field. Though the number of cases of COVID in Niger are still low. And I, I really wish that they stay low, but I can't imagine that because even in our environment, it is spreading and it's spreading very fast. So we do not know what the future measures of the administrations and governments will be, and that will impact on our decisions. So that means we have to take our decisions case-wise and depending on what the actual political and administrative rules are, we, try, we will try to adapt um, as well as possible. I foresee that Charles will not be able to enter into Niger and that will actually hamper on-farm activities because we can hardly replace him, replace him by, uh, by anybody. So I foresee for this season that we will have a lower number of uh, on-farm trials. Uh, our friends in Niger are still optimistic and I would like to support them in their optimism, but uh, there's also a pessimistic part in me saying that if Corona spreads, uh, probably numbers will consecutively go down. So, but let's hope for uh, the best. Um, there is already ideas uh, of Inran and Fuma, probably they can present them later personally, uh, how to deal with uh, this problem. We have produced already audio and video files that could be used for trainings so that people do not need to move between the different uh, regions. A problem appearing is uh, communication with Mori Ben. I had actually the leader of the farmer union yesterday uh, with a WhatsApp call uh, and he's still optimistic, but still uh, it's quite, quite difficult. Uh, I didn't get in contact by no way uh, with, um, uh, with the head of the uh, or the general director of the, of the Federation during the last week. So we need to develop new kind of uh, communication pathways. We need probably to rely on more digital resources. So that's one of the things we need to urgently develop during the next weeks. And we probably also need new communication pathways uh, having regular meetings uh, online with Skype or Zoom or whatever uh, in order to that the, that the communication is not interrupted. It will not be sufficient to have one planning meeting before the season and one after, but uh, we need to communicate regularly. Okay, so that was it for my part. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Ludger. Uh, before we go on to questions, uh, Charles or Ali or uh, Hanatu, do you have anything you'd like to add to Udra's presentation? Hanatu, okay. you go first. If you have something to say, Ali. <laughs> I hope you didn't fall asleep. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I will start 
Uh, thank you, Rutiga, for that uh, for this uh, presentation. I also thank the uh, SMIL team that organized uh, this uh, virtual meeting. Uh, I, I want to just uh, do some comment on the presentation. First, I want to notify to Lutiga, you should add in the partner that are contributor to the city ball uh, technology propagation. We have a women field project because Katiga we started this this year, but women field uh, financed by McNett Foundation. We started uh, using the seed ball for almost uh, three to four years like this. So I want to maybe to add this uh, partner is very interesting. And when you uh, you presented the results, you present on the yield are very low uh, this year compared to the previous years. I have some explanation related to this uh, low yield that we obtained this year. Because when we went on the field after sowing, most of the seed ball field did not germinate very well. So at the end, the number of a hill or the number of a panicle that we harvested is very low compared to the control one. This is what makes uh, uh, the, the yield very low this, uh, this year compared to the other years. That is something close to 40, but this year is 12 to 19 percent increase in the yield. Do you have, I mean, do you have an explanation for the low germination rates then? Yeah, the low germination rate is uh, due to the rainfall. When, because farmer did many resowing, resowing on seed ball. When we, they, they saw the seed ball, small rain maybe it germinates. When it germinates, sometimes uh, there's no rain, so uh, the just uh, small crop will die. Okay, I think the low germination is due to the rainfall. And it's not only seed ball, but even for the normal sowing. They did uh, many sowing. Sometimes the rain is not much. So some they can germinate, or maybe farmers will not uh, wait for many days for the rain, also good rain to come. They will just maybe try and they do the sowing. Yeah, but actually, if you remember uh, the effects of seed balls during the first phase, it was actually mainly in the difficult years that the seed balls had the uh, most positive effects. Yeah. And that is a little bit contradicting, exactly. isn't it? Yes, in 2000. I think 16 or 17, we have that problem, and it is only from seed ball that uh, farmers got something, especially in the northern part of the country where the rain started uh, middle of July. But this time now is, uh, I think, for the whole, uh, for 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 the normal and also seed ball. Because of I think the, there is a misconception somewhere. Perhaps yes. we need to correct it. If they can yes. you please go back to the slide. Is it possible? Which slide? So we have the yield effect. I mean, we are not talking about the general yield. We are talking about the yield increment effect of the seed ball. The, I think it's the second or third, third slide. <laughs> this one? Oh, oh, one. one. No, no, the, uh, uh, this, this one? one? Yes. Yeah, this one. <coughs> when you see this year, 2019, the increase in yield is uh, uh, around 19% and 12% uh, compared to the other years. Maybe 2018, 2017, that increase in yield is, uh, close, uh, is closer to 40%. Yes. It was between 30, 33, something like that, but on average 30 when we compare yeah. over the years. But now here the, yeah. the yield increment effect is a bit lower here. And now we are holding two factors responsible because mm -hmm. here we have a post-emergence fertilization. And with the seed ball, mm -hmm. when you have post-emergence fertilization, then the yield increment 
effect of the seed ball will decrease because now the control also has access to nutrients. Yes. So that's so that the explanation for that. And then yes. also last year, I think we had, yeah, even though we had problems in the beginning, but where we had issues, we uh, took care of them. Like now where we had challenges of germination, when we had resowing, they did everything, uh, they did resowing for both at some time also, but then when yes. the rain continued, uh, I think the rain ended late. And on overall, we have higher amount of rain, a relative higher amount of rain for last year compared to what we had in the last maybe three or four years. Yes, oh. that one is true because it uh, the rain has uh, the season has is extended, yeah. but also at the end for some places we have this uh, head minor mm -hmm. also uh, problem. Mm -hmm. Millet head minor which has make uh, a lot of uh, losses. Uh -huh. I did that, that yes. would have influenced both the seed ball and the non the non seed ball uh, yeah, tree. That, yeah, that both. was for both. We had them in the remarks. Yeah, yes, Maybe for further explanation on the data analysis, then I can hit more because we have it on the data sets on that remarks. Yes. And for data cleaning, I think from my analysis here, I uh, ensured that whatsoever we had here, that is, I removed anything that could cause bias between. The treatment yes. and then the, the control. Mm. So I think the result is okay, but maybe during uh, during a publication we can now emphasize more on that on on that discussion. So. Yeah, it is true. Okay, further questions. Come then on. on uh, this is on the scientific aspect. On the non-scientific aspect, I think am I allowed to say something more? <laughs> sure. Go ahead. Yeah. And with, uh, with uh, regards to whether I will visit Niger this year or not, yeah, like we earlier discussed, it is possible to travel to Nigeria, then maybe from Nigeria and then enter Niger. But that would be if uh, now that our border is closed, if eventually there will be a solution here, I don't know how it will be over there, the management of COVID-19 wise. So if it will be good there also, if they allow us to come, maybe if Germany will not allow me to come back to, to here if I leave, I don't know. <laughs> yes, uh, that's the, the problem. And the, even the plan to land in Nigeria is another question. Yes, so that one is just open. Mm -hmm. uh, no concrete no concrete and conclusions on that very aspect. But I am open and I am ready to yeah, do anything positive. Or and anything uh, that will you, make me meet my farmers again. Eh? Yes, if you arrive also, the time you will stay aside uh, before you mix with people will take about two weeks. That will be for the discussion. So two week quarantine, quarantine in Nigeria and two week quarantine in Niger. So then, yes. then, then over. I don't want to be quarantined in Nigeria. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what I have. Okay, thanks. There's a couple of comments that I received in the chat box. So um, Angela records uh, had a couple of questions. Are you still here, Angela? She she had to jump. Hello. Yeah, she had to jump on a different call, but she'll follow up later um, uh, with with her questions. Um, and also, Dr. Kane had a couple of uh, suggestions in terms of names for mechanization. So um, I can forward those to you uh, after the call. Uh, yeah, so those are some people from Michigan State University and Tyler International. Okay. Oh, really? And Bettina has a question, I'm sorry. What, what is the percentage of cases where yield of the seed ball treatment was inferior to the control yield? 
for example, the risk of the technique and the percentage of cases where seed ball yield was below the economic threshold. So with respect to the economic risk threshold, um, I cannot, cannot give the answer. I, I think uh, that is a story uh, uh, Tim has to deal with actually in, in the project. So um, we ha do not have real figures on the e economic situation. With respect to um, the cases where the seed ball treatment was inferior, Charles, do you have an answer for the 2019 season? What is the percentage of cases where the yield seed ball? Yeah, so if, if, if you look at the one-to-one -one line, yeah, if you plot if you plot all uh, uh, the cases into into a scatter diagram and then you establish a one-to-one -one line, how many of the cases have been uh, below the one-to-one -one line? I think I have it here somewhere on my table because I let me, let me see. So for the for the years 2016 to 2018, there was a trend. Uh, the first year, actually in 2016, we had about uh, a 20 percent below the one-to-one -one line. Uh, in uh, the years 2017 and 18, it was less than 10 percent. So there was was a positive development that it simply has to do that we have to train the farmers on uh, how to treat the control and things like that. Uh, most often where we have seen that we had negative effects, there were different treatments between control and uh, the seed ball treatment. So that was a major explanation so far. For 2019, I haven't seen the figures. Charles. So I have the figures. I have okay. the figures. Um, for NPK amended seed balls, mm. we have 78%. Positive. We are the NPK amended seed ball is higher than the control. Then for the wood ash, we have 88%. 88%, okay. Yeah, 88% for seed ball wood ash, and then 78% for NPK amended seed balls. So between 80 and 90%, roughly speaking. Yeah. Mm, yes. And what we have to take uh, into consideration here is that uh, in 2019, we had a lot of cases with post-emergence fertilization. Actually, uh, we still need to separate these cases and then look what, what impact that has. We haven't done this analysis so far. That is the best of us. I see a question from Jito uh, to you. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, promillet varieties that were used in these trials? Are they hybrids, OPVs, or land races? And did you notice, uh, if you did take care of that into consideration, did you notice, notice any differential effects? Yes. There were some effects from this. Uh, by variety, there were some effects. Maybe if I open my figure, I can give you some numbers, but there were some effects. Anna, too, what kind of uh, varieties did you use? I think that's yes. uh, so called improved varieties, isn't it? We have, yes, improved varieties. We have four varieties. We have uh, ECMV. We have Ikrita B, we have PPV Sarkin House, and, yeah. uh, and uh, the last one is uh, Ashkati. Okay, so the, these, these are yes. four varieties, four varieties uh, yeah. which are not land races and which are not hybrids. They have been yes. released mm -hmm. during different times, I think mm -hmm. during the last 20 years, uh, mainly under, uh, they were, uh, a part of them were developed <coughs> By Ikrizat, Ashkape, I don't know. Who, who developed Ashkape? In Iran. In Iran. Yeah. yeah. Iran. So yeah. These, these are all varieties released, released in Niger, either by, either by Inran or by Ikrizat. Or developed within the frame of participatory research projects. Mm -hmm. Other questions for, for the team while we have them here? Uh, a couple of questions from Peter Matlin. 
Yeah, look, you're, uh, thank you very much. Terrific presentation. I, I constantly find your work to be really exciting. Thank you so much. I have three questions. Uh, the first consider, uh, concerns the interpretation of the on-farm trial yield data, uh, comparisons between the controls and, and treatments. So my question is, are all farmers who are conducting these trials uniformly replanting when the seedling establishment and seedling density is low? If yes, uh, then the yield data that you're looking at is not simply the effect of the, um, of the treatment, but it's more complex in the sense that those that are replanting uh, have a uh, later date of planting for the reseeding. And uh, depending upon the proportion of the areas that are being replanted when initial seedling establishment is low would clearly shorten the, the growth period and therefore the interpretation of the yield data becomes somewhat more complicated. Also, for the economic analysis, one would then have to take into consideration the cost of the seed that's used in the first and possibly second replanting. And of course, the labor for the replanting has to be uh, incorporated into the economic analysis. So that's, that's my first question. Um, the second, we had a little talk there about the rainfall patterns, and I'm wondering if you are tracking and analyzing the effects of the rainfall initiation patterns across the sites, across the villages, and whether or not this might explain some of the uh, cross village uh, differences that you, that you saw, but also in terms of being able to understand better uh, the overall effect of, of the seed ball systems. And my last um, question is concerning the data from the root system studies. Um, what you showed us uh, was, you know, dramatic, it was interesting, but also very anecdotal. So I'm wondering how many plant root systems have been examined and uh, and are you systematically measuring the length and the, uh, the root biomass weight? Um, I mean, these kinds of root system studies, as you well know, are, are very challenging methodologically uh, to get good data. So a uh, little bit more understanding of what was behind the, that wonderful picture that you showed us. Thanks. Uh, thanks for these good questions. Um, um, well, it shows that, <laughs> that you have a uh, quite, um, 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 how to say, analytical view on, on what, what is happening in the field. So um, with respect to the root system, uh, I'm sorry at the moment being I can't give more because we have harvested these trials last Friday. And after harvesting, uh, we did the drying of the root system and weighing and that's all. Uh, for the moment being, the laboratories are closed due to the corona studies. So uh, we will do more studies on that as soon as we are allowed to use laboratories again. But for the moment being, that must stay anecdotal. I'm really sorry for that, but uh, that is really fresh results. We even harvested these, uh, these root systems uh, one week earlier than, than expected. So uh, I hope next year or in between, when we have a meeting, I can tell you more uh, on that story. With respect to the rainfall initiation pattern, very good idea, actually, but I doubt that we have sufficient uh, data, but uh, I think Hanatu and Aminu should, uh, should comment on that. Uh, how many rainfall data do we collect in the different villages on the study? Is there any kind of... Uh, studies at all or I think we started that once but I don't know whether that's because that is continued and and Hanatu your microphone's muted so Christine can you unmute her please oh okay we have uh, collected the rainfall data about 80 pluviometer uh, almost uh, in each village yeah we have uh, one in each village okay so then, uh, then we should uh, try to use this data in order to interpret the 2019 data. Yeah, so yes, that, would be one of, what, that would be then one of the next steps. So please uh, provide these data in a digital format. 
that we can uh, work on that here in Hohenheim too. Yeah. So that would be a task for Charles. And clearly what's yeah. important, what's it's important is inside the, the data. Yeah. I was just going to add what's important isn't only, of course, the total amounts, but it's the timing, the amounts and the timing with respect to the planting date. Totally correct. Uh, and I'm sure when you, when you have an interaction with your soil types, you, you'd get even a richer interpretation of what's going on. Yeah, thanks a lot for that hint. Yeah, that's really, really valid. Yeah. Other questions? There was, there was a, a, I think there's a third question of, of, uh, of Peter that was a question of replanting. Uh, so do we have, uh, I, I doubt that we, since we are working on farm, I doubt that we have real data on, uh, on replanting. Huh? In, uh, do we have data on, uh, on uh, emergence of the pockets and uh, dates of replanting? I doubt that. Yes, think, there is. There is. There is. Yes. Okay. Yes, there is. So that, then for the interpretation of the data, we have to cons consider that too. But uh, that's actually the work that is ahead of us. Yeah? So Charles, uh, please take, take note of these uh, two mentions and we should include that into the data analysis. Do we have more questions? Yeah, can I ask you uh, and comment? There is a question down here. Did you use also, uh, did you also use Apron Plus, Apron Star as fungicide, which is usually very beneficial to formulate and reducing downy mildew infestation? Mm -hmm. Well, for last year, the answer is simply no. Yeah. So actually, Apron and Calcio, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's the same product. It's just, it's just an, a, a different product name. Uh, so last year, we didn't consider that because uh, we have to take precautions for the applications. There are a lot of rules uh, by, uh, by the US government on how to proceed if you use pesticides. And actually, in the first year, we, would, would, we wanted to test first in the greenhouse trials uh, how we can formulate uh, Apron or Calcio, which is, which is the same, uh, uh, together with seed balls. So now we could show, and now we have an idea how to formulate it, and uh, we tend uh, together at least with a group uh, of, of the Moribin farmers to test it because they use it anyway. Whether we want it or not, they are going to apply it. And uh, so now we know how to handle this question and we will treat it uh, during hopefully this year's uh, test. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to comment possibly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for the variability you have seen in the increase of yield uh, at Jambal, you have seen a difference between the increase of yield um, uh, with the seed ball and the control. I mean, that was very, very big. Um, more variability. So the question to me, uh, are, are you going to run such an experiment including uh, of course coating with the fungicide as well because it is interesting for me if you have a wide range of uh, increase in terms of um, seed ball contribution in the increase of yield uh, combined with the possibility of coating to um, uh, eliminate the uh, uh, germination problem after sowing, that will be very interesting. Of course, you've mentioned uh, now that uh, you have the, uh, you know how to go about the fungicide. Uh, it will be better to me, I mean, uh, the time uh, you are uh, coating the seeds, uh, you make sure that uh, when you are putting them in the balls, uh, nobody will touch them. That will be the uh, safer way. Otherwise, you will be, I mean, uh, having the equipment required uh, to uh, be safe handling the, the, the pesticide. Sure. Uh, 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 another comment on what you are asking, uh, bringing the, um, uh, seed, uh, the seed ball 
um, fabrication uh, using that uh, uh, machine of FIOS from Germany, the good idea would be finding, I mean, artisan who can replicate locally uh, the machine. I mean, maybe you can put, uh, bring the machine, but replicating the machine locally um, should be the, uh, the, best, the best way to go about it. Because uh, the reason is most of the time, if uh, you import, it is very expensive. And uh, also um, after importing, uh, the possibility of um, maintenance become a problem and then availability of the, I mean, uh, those species. So uh, being uh, able to uh, find artisan who can be trained to reproduce could be a better option if that machine is working already for your seed balls. To, for, for, the, for, for making the seed balls. So those are the comments I wanted to bring in. Thanks uh, for the second comment. Uh, we have that in mind from the beginning, actually. That's why we try to use, uh, when constructing the machine, we try to use materials that are available also on site. Uh, but as I said, with the machine that we produced, um, the quality of the seed balls is not according to our standards. And that's uh, why now uh, we, we came to the idea with a, uh, with a concrete mixer, but that is not available locally. And I think that can also not be manufactured. I, I doubt that uh, as a manufacturing possibility on site. That's why I also have my doubts uh, bringing that machine into Niger, to be honest. Uh, there are big machines which yeah. cost thousands, thousands of, uh, of dollars in Nigeria. That's, that's for, for great scale application, but the small ones that we, which we have available here uh, are not available on the market over there. So, but uh, maybe Aminu can comment on that. Aminu? Mechanization question. Yeah, the way I I saw it in Germany, the the machine we the Miller's professor Miller's uh, department did. It is good for mixing. If we can get the type, the mixing is the is the most uh, studios work. So it's good for mixing and uh, for, uh, for demand time, if mm. we can get it for mixing and then the people can use the other machine we have, all the prototype we have, all, um, Charles already brought and uh, the hand for uh, doing the seed board. So, and uh, again, maybe if we get it here, we have uh, our, our, what you call it? Technician. Yeah. Yes. Technician, they can do it. They can do it very, produce it because we started with the other one, but we didn't succeed. But maybe this one, we can su succeed to make it locally. Yeah, sure. Actually, actually the machine is, uh... Uh, apart from the, the inner sieve, it's, uh, it's really simple. Uh, Charles, can you comment on whether the machine that we have uh, produced here at the university is, um, is good for the mixing purpose? No, I wouldn't recommend that machine because it's lying horizontally, unlike a concrete mixer that stands nearly vertically, although it can slide. So the, with this machine that we have here in Hohenheim, if you use it to mix, while mixing, the balls will be forming and the balls that form are usually not uniform. So I would still recommend we go for the concrete mixer and then after mixing, we can now pull it out and then use the, the, the other machine that I once uh, brought to produce the seed balls. Because if we use the one that we have right now to mix, I don't think it mm -hmm. will be good for us because as it's lying uh, horizontally, yeah? as it mm -hmm. rolls, as it rotates, balls will be formed. And that's where we usually have the challenge. Yeah, Except but if you want to pull out the ball and then add something to it again, which will become another work for, for the farmer. But, but the machine that, that we have constructed, uh, you can also incline it. So it's not necessarily that it works horizontally. You can also uh, 
uh, incline it and then have a different effect. So we should uh, still think about this option. But okay. let, let, let's come to the, fir to the first uh, aspect uh, of, uh, of Calcio uh, application. Um, I see the need, well, uh, well, first is the safety regulations. Uh, that's the one aspect that we have to consider. And the second one is uh, that we, if we apply it, we need also the control being treated. Yeah, and that is that that is actually causing causing uh, uh, greater concern per, greater concern than than uh, putting uh, the treated seeds into the seed pods where they are protected. So we still have to think about it how to uh, um, how to manage that. But on the other hand, to be honest, the farmers in the Falver region they just use it, mm -hmm. and if we don't allow them to use it then probably they use it without informing us. So that is a, that, that is a problem that we have. There is another question here from Nathana Bascom. There is potential to network with other partners around scaling. So what are the potentials for mass scaling, given that there seems to be village and seed depth effect? Yeah, that is a very good question. I think we, we have discussed that already and that is uh, one of the problems. Uh, um, let's say the technology is not that easy to distribute as for example a variety because uh, if you give, give another variety to, to a farmer, he will treat it as, as another variety. So sowing, sowing mechanisms will be the same and so on and so forth. Uh, for the seed ball technology, it's, it's, it's not that easy as uh, we have seen also with the Falwell case. Uh, there needs to be a certain kind of training. It's not, not just that we can say, okay, here's a technical she sheet and do it. Uh, there must be kind of, uh, you must accompany uh, actually at least the installation of that. And then there must be a person responsible um, taking taking charge of, uh, of informing the farmers and giving repeated input. So I don't see that the seed ball technology can be as easily distributed as, uh, as a, um, a seed variety, for example. So that's my personal opinion. So there needs to be training and probably also repeated training. Okay, great. Ludger and, and team, Ali and, and Charles and Hanatu, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I think that uh, that's been a great set of questions. I'm going to ask one, one more time, one last time. Are there any more uh, pressing questions that anybody in the audience would like to ask? Or if not, please follow up uh, with the team uh, via email or, or other uh, means. I don't see anything coming in. I just like to add a couple of points. But one thing, one one perhaps uh, uh, thing to think about is that uh, Bruce Hammaker's project, probably oh eight, ten, maybe a decade ago, um, had some work on developing a motorized agglomerator for couscous and dege. Uh, three prototypes were built. Um, one of the machines were they were built in in Niger. At, at the university in, in uh, Niamey. None of these have ever found a commercial home. They're, they're very expensive. But the interesting parallel is that it's a very similar design to what the concrete mixer and even the one photograph that I saw that um, you presented, very similar in design. Um, there may be perhaps something of uh, looking at that machine and how that works, certainly a very different size diameter, perhaps it could be applicable. But again, still not a very inexpensive machine to build. Um, and so I'm not sure to what extent it's, it's scalable in these circumstances. Um, okay, second, I follow up on that. Sure, do, do you wanna comment on that or? No, no, I follow up on that. Okay, That's okay good. Uh, and I think we probably have some photographs of that I can send you just for, uh, if I can dig them up, give me some time. Secondly, what I do see is that there isn't, it, looking at your, your yield effects, there seem to be a, a, a less variance or whatever your bars were 
um, capturing that confidence interval, it looked like there was a decrease in any sort of um, uh, variance in the treatments over the control. So there is perhaps undiscussed uh, at this point a risk management benefit that you mentioned, which I think should be teased out and happy to work with you on that in the future. Yeah. That is actually an aspect that, that will be also treated in, uh, in the uh, innovation evaluation by the social science group. Uh, so mm -hmm. that is one of the questions that, uh, that should be uh, elucidated during the interviews with the farmers. Right. So yeah. as we move forward, I, I suppose there's a good opportunity in this, in this time of uh, uh, the medical crisis that we can uh, take a little bit of extra time to analyze the data that we have and refine the questions that we may like to ask once conditions change as we move forward. Well, if there's no more questions, I'd like to go ahead and wrap up this session. To me, I'm very happy that we were able to connect three continents. Uh, we got our team from Marty very clear, um, our uh, European team and our US team. From my um, computer, I heard everybody very well and the video came in well. Anybody who's having problems, please shoot an email to Christine and we can see if there's anything we can do. It may be just a fact uh, an, uh, of uh, a bandwidth at your, at your end that we can't really overcome. Um, I think at this point in time that we'll just close this session. And uh, the last thing to note is that Christine is recording all of these presentations. So if there's something you missed, we will have them um, uh, online where you can download them. And also you can send Christine an email at a later 